My name is Don Griffin, and I work business development manager for Lyft. I spent the last 13 years in the airport industry working for the Metropolitan Washington Airports Authority. Excuse me. And uh, in March of this year, I made the switch to go and work for Lyft. And uh, quite a change in terms of culture working in the tech industry. Uh, going from working in a government type organization at an airport where everybody's looking forward <coughs> to retirement and going on to the next chapter in their lives and versus working now in a tech industry where the culture is uh, surrounded by millennials and <coughs> everybody's snapchatting on their phone and and using social dating sites like tinder and I'm sitting here with my phone trying to check my fantasy football score so <laughs> it's quite quite a difference um, but thank you Ray for allowing us to present today uh, we certainly are excited to be here and we hope to be able to come back in the future so let's get started So who we are, uh, here you see a picture of our founders, Logan Green and John Zimmer. Logan is on the right and John is on the right. We call John Jay-Z. Uh, we were founded in 2012 and we are now operating in over 190 cities across the U.S. So some of our values, uh, we want to be reliable, we want to be mobile, we want to be safe. In terms of reliable, we want to provide better service levels through lower estimated wait times averaging three to five minutes across 190 U.S. cities. We want to be mobile in providing seamless transactions from beginning to end, from ordering a lift to finalizing a ride with a 100% cashless transaction. Safety. We want to provide a safe alternative that leverages technology with enhanced GPS tracking, cashless payments, and a five-star rating system. And I want to expand on that a little bit with the uh, when we talk about enhanced GPS tracking. With the Lyft app, you can actually share your location as you're traveling in a Lyft vehicle through the GPS uh, feature in the app. So you can share that information in real time with your friends and family. So that's certainly an advantage to safety that hasn't been existing in previous ground transportation uh, options. Also, the five-star rating system. At the conclusion of your trip, you can rate the driver and your experience on that trip with the zero to five stars and provide comments. And that information is sent directly to our customer service center. And if there's an issue, we can immediately pull that driver off the app so he cannot continue to work on that app. And also the driver can rate the passengers as well if, there's, if he has an issue with the passenger. Oops, sorry. Some of our products. Um, we have the traditional lift product, uh, which is for passengers, up to one to four passengers in a vehicle. We also have the Lift Plus product, which is for larger groups, typically an SUV uh, for passengers, for up to six passengers. We have the Lift Line product, which two passengers can share the cost of a trip. Uh, typically, passengers going in the same direction uh, can share that trip, and at the end of that trip, that, that fare is split amongst both of those passengers. So certainly provides a cost savings in that regard. And then finally we have the Lyft Premier product and this is a new concept for Lyft uh, very similar to Uber Black. For those of you familiar with Uber Black, it's high-end vehicles, your Cadillac Escalades and Mercedes type vehicles. Uh, we are rolling that out and we're, and we're starting to, uh, it's even existing now in some of the larger cities across the U.S. So in uh, the third quarter of 2015 we operated at 13 airports across nine states. Fast forward to today, we now operate at 69 airports in 28 states. And this, we expect this to continue to grow going into 2017. I've, uh, we're looking to sign up a lot of airports in the first quarter of 2017, so uh, expect this rate to continue. So um, some of the features of airport permits and operations that we're seeing uh, on the left, we'll, we'll go into some of the financial terms, but uh, typically there's a permit or a trip fee associated with the permit. Uh, permit being that there's a fee just to obtain the permit. And then two, there's a trip fee. And uh, one thing I'd like to share in that regard is that we're seeing airports, typically smaller airports that want to obtain trip fees like they're a large airport. So they may only be seeing uh, a million employments uh, annually, uh, but they want the same fees as a CTAC or SFO. So it uh, really slows down the negotiation process when we start in that regard. So 
Uh, we really like to see airports do their research, do their homework, look what other airports are charging, and then come up with a number that makes it easier for us to get to a final number. Uh, there's typically a security deposit associated with these permits uh, where we're required to uh, leave some type of deposit to ensure we pay our trip fees. We're totally fine with that. Uh, there's typically insurance requirements. Uh, on average, it's about $1 million commercial general liability policy that we're required to uh, have in place, covering all the drivers. Uh, there's typically a monthly reporting requirement, uh, and we uh, self-report on a monthly basis. And auditing. The airports typically have the option to audit our books and records, uh, typically up to once or twice per year. So, and we're totally fine with that. Uh, airports coming in and auditing our records. Uh, operational terms, uh, typically we're required to comply with any local and state laws before we even enter into a permit with the airport. Uh, that's totally fine. And trade dress uh, requirements, as uh, Abu indicated, uh, we're required to have trade dress on all of our vehicles uh, in terms of our decal with our logo. Uh, and geofence, and we'll get into this a little bit later, uh, but typically we're required to uh, implement a geofence and we do that at no cost to the airports. Um, there's typically designated pickup and drop off locations uh, stated in the permit and defined so we know exactly where we're allowed to pick up and drop off and as well as designated staging areas. There's typically a defined staging area. And then finally uh, driver controls. Our, there's typically language in the permit where we're required to control our drivers. One, to not only comply with the terms of the permit, but also any airport uh, rules and regulations. And if they don't comply with those airport rules or permit rules, uh, we are required to pull them off of the app and they are not allowed to operate at the airport. And we are totally fine with that as well. Some of the ideal operational aspects. Uh, one is having a designated pickup and uh, drop-off location and typically pickups on the arrivals and drop-offs on the departures. Um, and with that, we like to see uh, the ability to perform pickups across the entire length of the curb instead of in a predefined uh, smaller zone area. The problem with that, when you have that zone area, you get bunching when, there's, uh, when passengers show up at the same time uh, with this, if there's a large event in town or what have you, and they all summons a driver to come and pick them up in this small zone, you get 50 cars show up at one time and then you got a backup on your uh, roadway. So being able to spread that out along the curb certainly helps uh, to ease congestion. Uh, additionally, signage. Certainly we, we would love to have branded wayfinding, but if, if, uh, if it's not branded, any type of wayfinding signage for passengers to find the pickup areas and uh, also for drivers to find the staging areas and the uh, drop-off areas. And then finally, a staging lot. And having a staging lot near the terminal or the pickup area certainly helps. Being able to move passengers on and off the curb quickly and efficiently, the quicker the driver can get there, the quicker the customer can get in and out the airport and ease congestion on the roadways. Uh, ETA and mileage. Uh, on average, our uh, pickup time, that's the time from when the passenger summons a driver. Uh, when he's in the staging lot is on average six minutes from the time he gets that request to the time he arrives at the pickup location. And in best uh, scenarios, it's two to three minutes. And also with mileage, it's on average one mile and uh, at best, uh, it's less than half a mile. So geofence, I'm going to talk a little bit about geofence. Uh, Lyft, we will develop and utilize a geofence system that virtually maps the predefined boundaries that are provided to us by the airport uh, in order to track our affiliated drivers while on airport grounds. The geofence will generate a notification each time uh, with the Lyft app enabled. So each time the driver enters the airport with the, la with the app enabled, uh, he enters or exits the airport boundary. There's a notification each time that happens and or he picks up or drops off a passenger inside that boundary. And like I said, the key to this is when the, the app is enabled. And also Lyft will utilize these notifications to generate a monthly report to the airport for all trips inside the geofence. And in that monthly report, we provide the date, the time, the latitude and longitude of each pickup or drop off on airport grounds and we pay the associated fees based on that information. 
with the geofence, uh, we black out. We, we have the ability to black out the entire airport campus except for the designated staging area, which you see in the center image there where you see those vehicles kind of bunched up in that little red box. That is the designated staging area. If they exit that area, they will not be able to receive a trip request from passengers. So this certainly helps with drivers hanging out all over the airport campus, which we certainly don't want to do that. We want to be a good uh, partner with the airports. And upon entering the, the designated staging area, drivers are placed in a first in, first out queue uh, where they can view their place in line using the app. And that's what you see on the right side, the, the driver uh, display where it shows his payments for the day, the number of rides he's taken, and also at the bottom you see where he is, his place in the queue. Application program interface, API reporting. Uh, the Lyft API allows third parties to receive ride data in real time. So uh, some of the uh, third parties that Abu talked about, AAAE, uh, just heard about ACI this morning, uh, as well as Gatekeeper is another. Uh, we're able to send data to these uh, third parties in real time. And this data provides the time, latitude and longitude, and vehicle information with the following ride events. The driver's entry into the geofence, excuse me, the driver's exit from the geofence, and the passenger drop-off, as well as the passenger pickup. So all this information is, is transmitted real time to third parties, and we are uh, certainly uh, uh, willing to do that. Uh, one thing we do like to see when this is written into the permits that it allows a bit of flexibility about how we do that. When it gets too in, much in the weeds and details written into the permit, it makes it harder for the two parties to work together to, to get to the ultimate end result. So just some flexibility in the language always helps. Driver cues. Drivers can view whether demand is high or low at the airport to ensure supplies balance. So what we're saying here is that before the driver even arrives at the airport, they have the ability to look at the queue at the airport to see how full it is. And they can make a decision there if they really want to go and sit and wait for you know, hours to get a trip request, or they can remain in the city and, and continue working in that way. So this certainly helps uh, address some of the concerns with uh, overcrowding in the, in the uh, staging lots. Uh, the airport passenger uh, requests. So passengers can select the nearest designate, designated location, pickup location, when they're at the airport. And what you're seeing here is uh, as the passenger is on the terminal curb, they can specifically say, hey, using the app, I'm at terminal two or door number two. And also there's instructions there for where they are to go to, to um, execute their uh, trip requests. So right here in the center picture, it instructs the passenger to go, please go up to departures. And once he's there, he can scroll and actually uh, input what uh, location he's at in terms of the door number. This is at SFO. So that way, when the trip is sent to the driver, he knows exactly where to go to pick up that passenger, whether the passenger is at door one or door two or, or whatever terminal he's at. And the same thing with DFW, we have, uh, they have gate numbers. Uh, and there's instructions there for where the passenger is to go and uh, to input what, where his location is. So this certainly helps the driver to get to the passenger very quickly and efficiently and he's not trying to search for a person standing there with his phone. He can go directly to the door number and find that passenger. Airport destination filter. Uh, the destination filter allows the passenger to choose their airline when they're headed to the airport. So the navigation feature in the app will uh, navigate the driver directly to the appropriate terminal for that airline uh, when they're tr transporting a passenger to the airport. So where we're headed, and uh, this is pretty much we'll talk a little bit about activity and revenue. This is some information, Abu kind of shares some more detailed information, but this is TNC revenue at SFO. This is combined revenue with both Uber and Lyft. And uh, in October 2014, we, as Abu indicated, we've made up 90% of the commercial ground transportation SFO. Fast forward to November, uh, a year later, we were at 54%, and Abu says it's now up to 60%, so that was new information for me. So that's great to hear. Uh, revenue was at $385,000 in October of 2014. Just in one month, <coughs> we now, uh, over a year later, generating $1.3 million in a month. Uh, to the airport. So 
quite a significant amount of revenue uh, being generated by TNCs at the airports. Airport investments. So as TNC activity trends continue to increase, airports should plan accordingly and consider how to best utilize airport real estate and ground transportation budgets to optimize airport operations. And this chart here, um, it shows the construction cost of a individual parking space in both above ground and underground spaces. The blue lines are underground spaces and the red being uh, above ground. And generally you kind of see things hovering around $30,000 for uh, construction costs for a single parking space. So just something to consider uh, when you uh, invest your airport budget dollars and your real estate, uh, as we see the trends with the, uh, TNCs continuing to grow, um, it, you know, you, you really want to consider how you invest those dollars. And that's all I have. Thank you.